Hi, my name is Alex Ozdemir, and today I'm going to tell you about some work that I did with Riyad Wabi, Barry Whitehat, and Dan Bonet on how efficient set accumulators can be used to improve verifiable computation. The core problem that we focus on is verifiable storage. The idea is to take a large storage, such as an array or a set, and represent it with a small digest in a way that allows operations over the storage to be verified given access only to the digest. This is useful in a prover verifier setting. You start by computing the digest, give the prover the full storage, and as the prover performs operations over the storage, it sends a transcript and some proof material to the verifier so that the verifier can check that the operations are being done correctly. In the case that the prover's operations change the storage, it sends the new digest to the verifier so that the verifier can verify the new digest accurately reflects the updated state of the storage. In this picture, uh, there are different proofs and different verification procedures, but you also might imagine wanting to batch them and verify all the operations at once. Verifiable storage is useful inside verifiable outsourcing. If you want to outsource a procedure that manipulates a large storage, then you're going to need a verifiable storage technique. And such procedures are important. For example, you might imagine a procedure that executes a transaction. It removes some money from one person's account and adds that money to another person's account. Such a procedure would be manipulating the account balances in this system, and the account balances are probably a large storage. Ultimately, a verifiable storage system is defined by the digests and by the way that verification is done, that is, by the verify procedures. And if the goal is efficient verification, then what you want is you want these verification procedures to be as fast as possible. Over the course of the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you about two different solutions to the verifiable storage problem. The existing one is Merkle Trees. This solution has been widely implemented and is used in prominent systems like the Zcash cryptocurrency. Another solution is RSA accumulators, which have not been implemented as widely, but have recently seen some theoretical developments that make them promising. And they are the impetus for our work, which is actually implementing RSA accumulators, including these new techniques, and demonstrating that they are, in some, many situations, cheaper than Merkle Trees. Of course, cheaper isn't well-defined until I tell you the computational model. And our computational model is inher inherited from verifiable outsourcing. It is the arithmetic constraint computational model, which we colloquially refer to as constraints. In this model, data is represented as elements from a large finite field. You can think of this as the integers modulo a large prime. And constraints, such as those enforced by the verification procedures, are expressed as equations over sums and products in this field with an additional requirement that there's only one multiplication per constraint. Of course, the goal here, you know, the notion of cheapness is reducing the number of constraints. One asset that we have is that this is inside the prover verifier setting, so the prover can provide advice. And this is often cheaper than computing things directly. For example, if what we want is the inverse of a field element, computing this directly via something like Fermat's Little Theorem would require many constraints. Um, but if the verifier just gives us the inverse, then we can check that it is correct in a single constraint. Let's talk now about Merkle trees, which are the existing solution to verifiable storage. So the idea of a Merkle tree is to build on a hash function that takes two inputs and produces a single output. And this is done by arranging the hash function into a tree of hash evaluations and using this to summarize the leaves, the storage, with a single digest, the root. Once this is done, proofs over the underlying storage end up being paths from the root to the element being looked at or manipulated. For example, if one wants to access x3, then one would provide the circled hash values and the verifier just has to check that all the hash evaluations along the path are correct. Storage proofs are similar, and so ultimately verification cost for such a system ends up looking like k log m, where k is the number of updates. The logarithmic factor comes from the fact that there's a binary tree, and the multiplicative factor of k comes from the fact that, to the best of our knowledge, there's not um, a meaningfully better way of aggregating the proofs over a Merkle tree. Uh, essentially, one just has to pay for each proof individually. This lack of ability to aggregate and the dependence on m are undesirable, and RSA accumulators, at least theoretically, offer us an alternative. RSA accumulators are based on RSA groups, which is a group of integers under multiplication modulo p times q, where p and q are large unknown primes. RSA groups have an interesting property, which is that it's hard to compute roots in them. So it's hard to compute x to the root, sorry, it's hard to compute the nth root of x, but it's easy to compute x to the n. And this asymmetry suggests a strategy for digesting a large set, which is to take the whole set and in some sense put it in the exponent.
of some expression. And that is exactly how the digest of an RSA accumulator is defined. The digest is defined to be some generator G raised to the power of the product of hashes of all of the elements. Here, the hash function maps elements in the set to numbers, and it has to have a special property that we'll talk about later. When digests are defined in this way, proofs of insertion and removal are easy. An insertion proof is just an exponentiation. You check that the old digest raised to the power of the hash of the inserted element produces the new digest. Removal proofs are just this in reverse, and a membership proof is just a removal proof. If you can remove an element, then you know it was there. All of these proofs end up having a soundness property that flows from the fact that computing roots is hard. Um, essentially, since computing roots is hard, the only way to remove an element from the set and produce the desired root uh, for the verification relation is to actually remove the element and recompute the digest. A final property of RSA accumulator proofs that was recently discovered and is extremely exciting is the fact that batching them requires only a single explanation, exponentiation. Let me spell that out in more detail. If you want to do k different operations, for example, k insertions, then you have to do k different hashes in the verification procedure, but you only have to do one exponentiation. Um, and this asymptotically is much better than Merkle trees because of two things. First of all, the dependence on M, the size of the set, has been removed. And second of all, the most expensive part of the verification, the exponentiation, is independent of K, the size of the batch. So RSA accumulator proofs are asymptotically better than in Merkle trees. Uh, but this does not mean that RSA accumulators are concretely better, and that was the point of our work, to actually implement them and find out whether they require fewer constraints than Merkle trees. In the course of doing this, we came up with a number of techniques and tricks, um, and what I'll do now is tell you about just one of them that I think you might find interesting, which is the way that we constructed a hash function to prime numbers, which was required for the batching algorithm of RSA accumulators. So the traditional approach for hashing to prime numbers is essentially rejection sampling of primes. Which, what this means is that if you're taking some input x and you want to hash it to a prime number, then you use x as the seed to a PRG, and while the PRG's output is composite, you keep on advancing the PRG. Eventually, you come up with and return a prime number. The critical step here is the test of primality, which traditionally is the Miller-Rabin primality test. Um, importantly, this is a probabilistic primality test, and in order to achieve 2 to the negative lambda soundness, it has to do order lambda rounds of the test, each round being an order lambda bit exponentiation. And since exponentiations end up being pretty expensive in constraints, uh, this is a, a rather expensive way of hashing to a prime. Uh, and so we pursue an alternate strategy. Our strategy is based on something called Pockington's criterion, which is a number theoretic statement that says that if p is a prime and n is a number less than p, such that some number theoretic conditions are satisfied, then n times p plus 1 is also prime. And when you look at this criterion from the thousand foot perspective, what you see is that it converts a prime p into another prime that can be up to twice as wide as p. And this suggests that Pockington's criterion can be used as the basis, or rather the recursive step, for a recursive primality step uh, certificate. And in turn, this suggests that one could do rejection sampling not of primes, but rather of valid prime certificates. And that is exactly what we do in our implementation of hash to prime. We start with some base primality test and generation procedure, and then we recursively enlarge the produced prime using Pockington's criterion until we get a prime with enough entropy for our purposes. At every step in the process, we use PRG-based rejection sampling, both for the base case and for the n values of each recursive step. Ultimately, this results in a prime that is one, provably prime, and two, much cheaper to verify um, than executing Miller-Rabin. Uh, this is, of course, not the only technique that we employ. Um, just a, a few other highlights. Um, we provide a good implementation of multi precision arithmetic in terms of constraints that's based on the techniques of XJSNARK and also includes some new techniques of our own. Um, we also require a hash function for the RSA accumulator that is something called division intractable. And we uh, construct a new hash function that we conjecture to have this property. Um, and then we additionally consider the semantics of batching dependent storage accesses. So for example, you could imagine one storage operation in which you replace a 5 with a 7, and then another one where you come along and replace that 7 with an 11, 
Um, and the question is begged, what is the semantics of putting these two operations into the same batch? Uh, we precisely describe these semantics and show that they are in some sense exactly what a reasonable application would want, with of course the details of this being in the paper. This, uh, these techniques enable us to actually do an implementation of RSA accumulators. Uh, this implementation is done inside Bellman, which is a Rust library based on the Groth 16 proof system. We consider storages of varying size, we perform varying number of memory operations, and we measure the number of constraints required by the Merkle trees and by an RSA accumulator. Uh, we find that indeed RSA accumulators are concretely better in terms of number of constraints than Merkle trees at reasonably large uh, accumulator sizes and reasonably large numbers of swaps. Um, as a note, we also measure, um, or at least make some measurements of proving time in the paper, um, but proving time is more complex and there are some problems there for RSA accumulators. Uh, the details of course are in the paper and we think there's room for a lot of future work here. Uh, okay, so ultimately, in conclusion, um, our research question was whether RSA accumulators use fewer constraints than Merkle trees. Uh, in answering this question, we implemented RSA accumulators employing a number of interesting techniques summarized here. And ultimately, we answered the research question in the affirmative. RSA accumulators do require fewer constraints than Merkle trees for reasonably large accumulators and reasonably large numbers of operations. Our implementation is public. You can find it at the URL there. We encourage you to play around with it or build on it. Uh, and I'd like to take these final seconds to thank first my collaborators who made this project a real joy to work on, and also the audience. I hope that you got something interesting out of this talk, and I understand there will be a Q&A, so I look forward to your questions.